Welcome back to Shannon's Club TV, where we open up the archive on our favourite cars from Australian roads and racetracks. In each episode, we profile our feature car with rare images, evocative stories and a well-preserved owner's example. Now, coming up, we'll get the latest market updates from the Shannon's auctions team. But right now, though, the car that could have been the pinnacle of large family car design, but was compromised by an old world engineering hierarchy, the HQ Holden. The HQ Holden was almost achingly beautiful in July 1971. This sleek, solid, spacious Aussie design had the potential to be not just Australia's best car, but as good as anything of its size in the world. But the engineering problems of the HQ Holden range reflected divisions within General Motors Holdens. Sadly, it came down to the chief engineer, American George Roberts. Having spent time at Cadillac, Roberts prized a plush ride above all. He also held the ill-informed view that extreme understeer was a safety feature. Roberts liked to demonstrate a high-speed manoeuvre, which involved grabbing a heap of steering lock. The car ploughed straight ahead. Mark, I doubt he ever performed this trick in front of Peter Brock. Mm. Is it any wonder that so few HQ Holdens were raced? Well, the thing is, at the time, General Motors Holden, you know, the GTR XU1 Tirana was their nominated competition car in both racing and rallying. However, I do remember talking to Holden dealer team boss, the late Harry Firth. He had an HQ Holden as his personal drive car. And I remember he went out one day and just in a few hours he changed the camber settings, the caster settings, which instantly transformed the car's steering response. And I think he even went further with stiffer anti-roll bars, springs, that sort of thing. He transformed the handling of the car. It was so easy and cheap to do, and yet Holden's engineering department just did not want to know. They didn't want to do it. So in a sense, Harry Firth made a HZ Holden years ahead of its time. Had a first crack at RTS, if you want to say yeah. that. But what it yeah. shows is the car was really effective in competition. It could have been, but not with that handling. Yes. Probably no other automotive manufacturing company in the world boasted as many models all built on the one platform as the HQ. There were sedans, wagons, utes, the one tonne truck, limousines, and of course, a fabulous Monaro GTS in coupe and sedan form. By HQ time, Holden had got the complex options business licked. You could specify just about any Holden you wanted. The HQ was brilliant in several ways. The ride was superb and it took the rough with the smooth better than any other car with the exception of the Peugeot 504. Visibility was first class through A-pillars which was strong but the thinnest in the world. And the car was enormously rugged. One positive that came out of the George Roberts era is that HQ, HJ, HX handling was so appalling that the GM world intervened to fix the problem. Out from Opel came Chuck Chapman as Managing Director and Joe Whitesell as Chief Engineer. Radial tuned suspension followed in record time. Had the HQ been engineered this way in the first place, it would probably live in our memories as the greatest Holden ever for its time. Sure, the six-cylinder engines were ordinary, but there was nothing wrong with the 253 V8, while the 308 and the Chevy 350 were crackers. Mark, racers didn't exactly queue for the HQ when it was new, but there were some standout cars, weren't there? Yeah, and arguably the greatest of them all belonged to a famous Aussie all-rounder. Tyre retailing giant Bob Jane owned and raced some of the most exciting sports cars and sedans in Australia. And one of the best remembered was the HQ Monaro GDS 350 Coupe he drove with great success throughout the 1970s. It was conceived as a state-of-the-art improved production touring car in 1972. However, the demise of that class saw the Monaro reassigned to a new career in the highly modified sports sedan division, where Jane proved tough to beat, particularly at Calder Park, for six consecutive seasons. Powered by Chevrolet's 350 V8, Jane's fuel-injected Monaro ended up with more than 600 brake horsepower. Even so, it clung stoically to its muscle car roots, with a conventional front engine, four-speed gearbox and live rear axle, which proved how fundamentally right it was from the start. 
A continual process of chassis and engine refinements over six seasons kept its competitive edge razor sharp. John, although the HQ Monaro GDS you know, proved it could succeed in motorsport, Holden generally pushed it as an interstate grand tourer, and in that role, it was exceptional at the time, wasn't it? Well, I think it was, and even mm. though the, the GTS was obviously firmer than a Kingswood or a Premier, I think the ride was still quite soft. Mm. And the cornering ability, it's like the US idea of the Boulevard ride, there are three corners in America. You know, <laughs> when you're driving into state, you're not looking for a car that's got the, the world's best, sharpest turning, mm. it's ride comfort. and and effortlessness that you want, and I think the car would have been superb in that role. In that with role. that, that yeah. four-coil suspension on, on the roads, particularly back in the early 1970s, it would have been sensational as an interstate tourer. Absolutely right. Yeah. It's also worth mentioning, I think, that there weren't all that many 350s. These no. were principally the cars that the dealer principal could dream up and not have to pay for. That was the premium that, dream the machine, The premium dream machine. I think most Aussies were very happy with the 308 mm. or even the 253 in their GDS. Mm. Yeah, but the 350 GDS four-door, wow, that's a, that's a car I remember with you know, great fondness. And it was much pilloried at the time because mm. it didn't handle all that well. It was no match for the GT, but I think I'd still be pretty happy to have one. Yeah, but if you had four up and had to go interstate, what a Indeed, car. Indeed, absolutely. Yeah. Another racing development of the HQ Holden occurred in 1972, although unlike Bob Jane's Monaro Coupe, this improved production car was based on the humble four-door Kingswood model. That decision alone ensured strong spectator support. The project was backed by Adelaide's largest Holden dealer, City State Motors, which wanted to boost Kingswood sales by promoting the model through racing. However, it was restricted to using an engine no larger than Holden's 308 cubic inch or 5 litre V8, the largest engine available in the Kingswood lineup. Driver Malcolm Ramsey and race engineer Tony Alcock ensured the Kingswood would not be down on power by installing a full house Repco Formula 5000 racing version of the Holden V8, which, with fuel injection, had close to 500 brake horsepower on tap. Sadly, although the car showed great potential in its debut season, the demise of the improved production class brought the project to a premature end. Decades later, though, the HQ Kingswood would rise again at grassroots level, starring in a hugely popular One Make series. Other great episodes of Shannon's Club TV are available to view anytime on the club website. My name's Barry Hasem, I'm from South Gippsland and as you see I've got my HQ350 two-door coupe. The car was purchased in the 30th of December 1973. The car then remained in his ownership until 2004. The car was pretty original, but the paint was rather ordinary. The car's now been painted from top to bottom. That's about the only thing that's been changed on the car. It's stock original inside, never touched inside the boot, undercarriage and the engine bays had a little bit of a clean. But the car, in essence, is pretty much the same apart from the paint job. It's a factory 350, which is a Chevy, detuned because it's a Series 2 HQ and my belief is by that stage they weren't making too many, if any, manuals at that point uh, because they were no longer racing and they detuned this one down to, I think it was from 275 to 250. But I just love the old car, I love the ability to sit in there and just cruise and cruise. My thoughts on HQ, I had EJs, FJs, FCs, etc. And at the introduction of HQ, the first thing I remember seeing was a photo of one in a newspaper. And when I saw it, I thought that is absolutely beautiful. And having then seen the Monaro coupes, I thought that's poetry in motion, even just standing still. So after that, I just had this desire one day to get an HQ coupe. And luckily enough, I came across this car at the Bendigo Swap. I can't say any one thing about what my favourite feature of the car is, it's just the car in general, everything I look at I just adore. Absolutely marvellous and I wouldn't change a thing.
Well, Tiny Hansen joins us from the Shannon's Auctions team to talk about the HQ Holden. Welcome to the show, Tiny. Thanks, Mark. Thanks Hello, Tom. Tiny. How I'm thinking you? that the HQ must be just about the ultimate choice among the, the cruise brigade. Yeah. And I'm also thinking that just about any variant would be highly collectible now. Oh, for sure, John. Look, there's, uh, there's a lot of HQ Holdens out there. I, I go to a lot of cruise nights around Melbourne and there are a lot of HQ Holdens coming up, whether they be six-cylinder 202 Belmonts, Belmonts. right yeah. through to the 350 mm. Monaros, GDS Monaros. Yep, yeah. you can see them all. Which ones do you think are the most sought after? Well, of course, the, 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 um, the GDS Monaros are all, always going to hold a premium over the other ones, mm. but um, there seems to be a lot on, lot on the road. It's good to see HQs on the road. They're quite prevalent, mm. and the, um, we certainly see them through the auction department. Um, some of the HQ 350 cars are really holding a good premium. With the GTS, is the coupe more sought after than the sedan, or not much different? That's a tricky one. Uh, the coupes are very, very popular, but you get a good HQ 350 sedan. Yeah. Very, very popular, and, yeah. and very few, fewer numbers with the sedan with the 350s mm. as well. Great and car, though. Like the HQ, there were so many, so many model variants. You, know, you had the, the first four-door Monaro that we've spoken about. You had uh, the one tonner, and you had that beautiful Statesman with the longer wheelbase. I mean, that's got to be a collectible now. A good statesman yeah. in good original condition, especially if it's got the V8. 350, 350 yeah. V8, yeah. that's yeah. the way to go. Yeah. As I said, low numbers, mm. very, very collectible, very desirable car. Mm. Yeah. And and even the utes and the wagons. Utes. And the one tonner. Wagons. The one tonner. First time, first time we saw a car based cab chassis commercial. Yep. Fantastic. It really they're still was out a, there, they're still being used. Yeah, yeah, it really was a cutting edge model. What concerns me though, uh, we did see in the 80s and 90s the HQ Holden Racing Series. Hundreds of mm. HQ Holdens went into battle there. And gave I think their we, lives. <laughs> the gave their lives. Yeah. I think we lost quite a few. Has that damaged the uh, the spare parts supply? Well, yes, it has. I mean, mm. there's a lot of... For, um, I wouldn't think you'd be able to find a good front end for HQ floating around in right? wrecking yards anymore. No, they've wow. all, all been... They're all being snuffed up by, the, a, by the cert, racing fraternity. You certainly wouldn't find a statesman front end. They're all on the, no, all that's the right. utes. <laughs> all on the utes and they're all on the panel vans, exactly. So what would you, uh, your advice, Tony, for someone who wants to buy an HQ Holden, any model? Well, if you're going to buy a HQ Holden, originality is the way to go. Yeah. doesn't mm -hmm. matter what it is, whether it's a 173 Belmont, yeah. right through to the 350 GDS. As long as it's original, in good condition, I'd be snapping it up. That's the way to go. Way to go. Good, good advice. Thanks, Tiny. And remember, you can keep up to date with all the latest Shannon's Auctions news on the Shannon's Club website. For a lasting memory of the Holden HQ in competition, visit the incredible archive at autopix.com.au. John, looking back at the HQ Holden, you know, history remembers it as a car that brought a lot of really exciting new things to Holden. But that whole handling equation has been like an Achilles heel. Peter Werrett told me a story. Mm. When he was reviewing the next model after the HQ, the HJ on his television program Talk, mm. it locked up and went sideways under brakes. Holden invited him to go to the Lang Lang Proving Ground so he could review this and hopefully go away with a different opinion. But in the end, they agreed to differ. George Roberts very kindly offered to drive Werrett to the airport. When they got there, <laughs> that would have been good. When they got there, where it, remember where it was teaching advanced driving, yes. where it said, George, thank you for the lift, but I now understand why your cars handle so badly. <laughs> George, you are the worst driver I have ever been with. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> yeah, I think it is. Because I know that even at Holden at the time, there were young engineers who could see how easy it was to fix this problem, but Roberts was absolutely stuck. They were seething. Mm. You can just imagine the division in the camp, but of mm. course, as you know in corporate life, the boss prevails. Exactly, and it'll always be remembered as the major flaw of the HQ Holden race. Absolutely right. Yeah. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this nostalgic look at the fantastic HQ Holden, including the Monaro GDS 350. We look forward to your company next time on Shannon's Club TV. Bye for now.